Hello, my name is Tosca Bruno van Vijfeiken and I co-direct the Transnational NGO Initiative at Syracuse University. Today we're doing a web interview uh, with Dave Tucker, uh, ca Trade Campaign Officer of War and Want, which is a UK-based global justice NGO. Thank you very much, Dave, for allowing us to interview you today. This will definitely be a helpful tool for both students and faculty. Um, First, I'd like to make sure that we're all clear on what the nature and mission of War on Want is. Would you mind explaining? Well, we're a UK-based NGO, but we see ourselves as really part of a global justice movement. So um, our remit is anti-poverty or fighting global poverty, um, as it has to be in the UK, because uh, the charity commission laws state that you can't be party political and so on mm. um, but we do define ourselves as more on the political end because we see the challenges of, of poverty as being essentially political and hence our strap line poverty is political poverty is political which is a very strong uh, statement indeed a very powerful one now how did you personally first become interested and become engaged in transnational activism if you will well, I'd have to say through personal experience, which I think is mm. pretty common in our sector, at least in the UK, can't speak for here, but it was through traveling um, around and teaching in Southeast Asia and Africa when I was uh, just before going to university. Mm. And then having come back and doing an undergrad degree in history and, and getting into the kind of social aspects there and pol political aspects as well, um, I wanted to translate that into uh, a practical change to deal with some of the things that I'd actually seen while, I've, while I was traveling. And the combination of those two things, I think, uh, an analytical perspective and a personal drive to... I mean, specifically for me, it was around tourism. Because I while I was based in um, certain areas in the north of Thailand, in Borneo, for a while, and having the perspective from living there, I was also coming into contact with uh, tourism on a regular basis as I was traveling around. And what you can see clearly is that it's a sector that has a great potential to do a lot of good, but also to do a lot of harm. And by and large, it's doing a lot of harm at the moment. And so that sort of became my initial drive and continued to this day, although it's got a bit more into trade and, and more macro issues. Mm -hmm. But you actually started your career, I think, in, uh, in an NGO that focused on the role of tourism in global and third world development, right? Yeah, that's right. In the UK context, you really have to volunteer for a certain period of time in order to get your feet in the sector. And for me, that was around five months. Um, and I was lucky because my, I, my parents live in London, which is where generally the work is. And so I was able to do that full time for about five months. It's more difficult um, for people who aren't able to do that and that you have to get work yes. and paid jobs yes. and so on. So. Mm. Um, now, if you think of War on Want as an organization, uh, what are currently up to three core challenges that War on Want is facing as it's trying to be effective? And how is your organization dealing with those challenges? Well, first and foremost is the issue of building a global movement. Um, as I mentioned before, we see ourselves very much in, in that tradition of, of labor. I mean, we come from the labor movement and the workers' movement in the UK, and we see our nat natural position with struggles for, for migration, for climate, for, uh, against corporate globalization, and so on. Now that is a very uh, diverse and divergent set of groups, I'd say, with, mm. with diverse interests. And what you've seen, I think, in the 10 or so years since Seattle um, and the big mobilization there is, is trying to bring those networks and those uh, perspectives closer together and, and make them into a more coherent and more positive agenda. Um, that's not to downplay the difficulties and differences that still do exist. Um, but I think, you know, we're making inroads in a lot of ways and, and certainly compared to where we were 20 years ago, then um, it's a much more, I think, much more interesting time to be part of the NGO scene. Um, as far as our organization goes, I think we, one of our top challenges is being more effective. Um, now, how do you define effective? That, uh, that was actually going to be my <laughs> next question. Well, for us, um, I mean, the obvious way to, to define it would be to say how much legislative change are we achieving. 
which is a proxy for how much social change are we achieving. But it, you've got to recognize it for that. It is still a proxy. So for us, you know, we, um, we look at influencing public opinion, and so media is a very big channel for us. And um, we also try to position ourselves as, if you like, creating a, a bigger consciousness that's not just issue-based, and it's not just siloed like you do get in a lot of um, uh, NGOs, but actually joining the dots and trying to be more structural about it. What is it that joins supermarkets to um, uh, uh, private military security companies to uh, you know, what's happening in Iraq and so on? And there are common threads that can be drawn. And I think if you look historically at how social change has happened, it, it is always a conjunction of those very disparate interests that, that, that coalesce around a certain mo moment mm -hmm. and, and start to share some analysis of what's wrong. So that's a huge challenge. I think it's a very difficult challenge. It's also very difficult to quantify. Yes. But in terms of long-term social change, I think it's absolutely vital. And certainly mirrors, what we try and do is mirror our partners on the ground in the global south who, who tend to have a lot more radical perspectives than US or UK or even European NGOs have. Mm -hmm. um, a third challenge, I would say, is internal. Um, in, in, uh, the aim over the next five years is to become a learning organization, which is really to create a kind of free feedback loop in what you're doing and have a continual um, appraisal of, of, of how well you're doing and how efficient it's been and how effective it's been and try to feed that back into your next set of plans. I mean, that's good practice, but when you're doing it on a day-to-day -day basis in a situation of very limited resources, it's often the thing that gets dropped off the end Yes. Um, very commonly. So, so that has to be institutionalized to a certain extent. So that's the next challenge for the us. next challenge. And so coming back or following up on how you already said that Warren One tries to define effectiveness, you talked about um, wanting to affect social change, not just legislative change. Mm. You talked about wanting to be effective in terms of connecting the dots between different aspects of power distribution, injustice, etc. Um, so if you define your uh, effectiveness that way, how do you currently try to assess whether you're effective? You talked about how as a learning organization you mm. want to get a still better handle, but what are you currently, what kind of mechanisms, what kind of system do you have in place to assess your effectiveness right now? Well, I think for, for me personally and for the campaign side of our organization, um, we're actually quite reliant on institutional funding at the present time. And part of that is a reporting process that has to be done yearly. Mm -hmm. um, so th you will actually look at factors like how much media coverage did you get, and that's quantifiable. Yeah. Um, you, how many people you have signed up to email lists and how many people are receiving communications and messages on a regular basis, as well as the, the number of meetings that you've had with key decision makers and some of the outcomes. So it's a mix of the kind of quantitative and qualitative mm -hmm. um, analysis. And that also holds for the program side, the sort of more traditional development work of our organization. So we, we fund partners on the ground. And again, um, they l will look at quite a numbers-based um, outputs of uh, how many workshops you've held and how mm -hmm. many, um, how much money has gone into certain projects and what are the outcomes of those. Mm. So I think it's it's a really for us about becoming more consistent between our programs and our campaigns and working out. Um, a set of key indicators for ourselves. I was going to say, you framed your answer by indicating that it's institutional funders who require these annual reports. Mm. So the, the indicators that you just described, are those indicators that are not just satisfying to the funder, but also help you to be a learning organization, to learn about your own and reflect on your effectiveness? Or do you find that the indicators uh, tend to be uh, skewed towards what the funder needs, which may not be what you need as a learning mm. organization. Mm. I think uh, it's probably very much skewed at the moment, although there's going to be a large amount of overlap between you know, what, you, what you've put in your log frame at mm. the beginning, what you have to report on, um, and then what you would actually look at if you were just doing an internal process. But in my experience has shown that I think those internal processes also need an area of uh, brainstorming and reflection 
and you know whole days blocked out where you will go and, and talk about um, more or less the intricacies of how you've done things and what you feel has been effective whereas the the indicators for um, external funders I'd, I'd say is more or less a tick box exercise okay. you know so um, it's it's not it's not bad but I would say it's very heavily skewed on a kind of bang for your buck right model. And so it needs to be complemented by it that needs to be complemented yeah. right yeah. right so my next uh, and last question is going to be so you lead the trade campaigning in war on want at the level where you work in war and want what does it take to be a good leader uh, what kind of skills are required both the formal ones but i'm also interested in the informal ones mm. how would you describe those skills needed well um in more general terms i think you know policy knowledge is important in campaigning also communication almost verging into marketing in a way so you have to be familiar with um, web tools with the new social media like Facebook and mm -hmm. so on and how to use those effectively. Um, you also need to, I think, have very good organizational skills. So I'm leading a project, that the project that I'm involved in, which is funded by the European Union, is actually three NGOs in three different countries. Mm. So I'm responsible for coordinating that and, and keeping the financial um, side accurate and up to date and so on. Um, so that's the, the project management as a bundle is another of set of skills mm -hmm. and a huge part of it of course is inter inter interaction with other people and being able to work within networks is a key thing for us being a relatively small NGO and working on a huge issue mm -hmm. like international trade we try and magnify our influence through the networks that we're in and that's going to involve quite a lot of um, not compromise but discussion about how how far people can go, how far they can they can push the boat out on what they're going to say, and then how you bring those kind of networks together. So there's always multiple tensions, I'd say, between what you're representing and uh, what other people are representing and what you can do together. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that kind of um, process is a, is a really key part of, uh, I think, of leading a campaign and being a useful person within those international networks. Right. Well, very interesting. Thank you so much for this interview, Dave. You're welcome.